Hi everyone, welcome back to the Krispy Kreme. Uh, it's the home of the most relevant memes in the world. How are you doing today, Duncan? Oh, I was just going to let you uh, go on with that. Um, no, I abandoned that it. <laughs> try and keep that joke Rats fleeing the sinking ship. Uh, welcome to the Golden Talkies podcast, is what Jimmy meant to say. I'm doing great today. Um, cool. Not great, I'm fine, I'm, I'm cool. How are nice you? You're hungover. Very good. Uh, yeah, other than that slight little difficulty, I'm very good. I mean, it's the afternoon now, uh, or evening, technically, because uh, you made yeah. me wait so fucking long. Yeah, sorry, I had a uh, wee, wee meet-up there. <laughs> it was pretty stressful. I was planning I'm pretty much I, was, I was planning to meet two people, and then we bumped mm-hmm. into more people, and we ended up in a big group, and I was very stressed out. I, I didn't like it was at it, all. Was it, was it more than six? It was more than six, Jamie, and I really, really was not a fan. Um, God, I can't believe... We can talk to a criminal. I was man. trying gonna... to, I was trying Wait. to sit as far apart as possible, but it just was a bit awkward, and I kept worrying someone was going to come and tell us not to. And uh, everyone else, come everyone else just seemed personally and snap your neck. Everyone else just seemed super chill with it, and uh, yeah. Are you finding that? Are you finding that a lot of people just seem to not care about the rules at all? Yes. Yeah. Definitely. I find it very stressful because uh, I'm trying to follow them as uh, closely as possible, um, and yet yeah. it's hard when no one else is. Um, Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where that's we're yeah. all in it together. That's why I'm late. I, it wasn't fun. I mean, it was nice to mm. to you know speak to people again, but just not yeah. not the way I would have chosen. But hey ho, that's fair. Fine. I don't know. There's, there's only so much you can do, and you know exactly. I'm not. I mean, we were we were outside. We were outside in a park, and I was sitting, you know, at least at least a meter, if not two yeah. meters apart from um, everyone. So yeah, I think uh, yeah. you know. As far I as think it goes, out, it's not outside. Is supposed to be pretty safe and exactly. General, as far as inside. things go, you know, I've done okay. Uh, I think as long as you're not indoors, then you're probably okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but though, obviously, you should still follow the rules. Yeah, everyone that's I'm listening. I'm crinkling what, that next microphone. What was that? I was crinkling a wrapper like absentmindedly, and I realized that's probably bad form. When you're yeah, I do recorded. that quite a lot though. I'm fiddling with something at the moment, and that'll probably come up. Mm. Um, what is this podcast, Jamie? Uh, so here we like to talk about films that came out 50 years ago this week. Yeah. Uh, this particular time, this particular ep, this particular uh, LP, uh, we're discussing the film There Was a Crooked Man. 1960. Uh, 1970. Oh, wait. Although there is a 1960 film called the same thing. Wait, did you watch... Wait. Oh, no, I thought we were doing a special 60. Did you watch the one from 1970? Ha ha ha! Yes. Uh, oh, I meant to figure out what, Wit. what's the difference. They're, they're completely unrelated, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it's just a cool title for a film. Like people like to name films after nursery rhymes, right? That's like the best thing you can possibly do if you're a film titler. So yeah, and there, Crooked Man is quite good because you know, crooked it, it means you know, criminal. Yeah, I'm I'm looking so, up now uh, the 1961, and it's a British film about a law-abiding demolition expert who's duped by a gang of criminals into helping them. So completely different from this film, yeah. which is a western. Although technically that one is There Was a Crooked Man, and then that's the title. This one is There Was a Crooked Man, Ellipsis. So that's how you know it's different. Oh, is it? Ah. Yeah. That's probably for... Oh yeah, I, I hadn't even really noticed that. Neither did I until I had both pages on Wikipedia <laughs> in front of me. I always thought that it was just like, you know when you, you have a website and it goes longer than fits and you just put an ellipsis? Yeah, exactly. I assumed everything that I was looking at was just that. Yeah, you're right, it does have a wee ellipsis at the end. Well, mm. there you go. Um, cool, cool. So this film is a western. It has yes. to be said, we've watched quite a lot of westerns. Um, well, this is this is like towards, definitely towards the end of like the western's popularity, but it's still there. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, I don't know what. Do you know why westerns died out specifically? Was it just like boredom, or was it like a sudden thing? Where like, cause I know like with musicals, it was like Hello Dolly was like the film that killed big Hollywood musicals, and um, after that film, they never made them again. I don't know if there was like an equivalent. For I westerns. actually, I actually don't know. Hmm. Yeah, no, I'm afraid I have no clue about that. Um, I, I mean, I, there was, I don't know if they, they ever died. I think it's just there, there's a. Like if you look, people are still making them, not as much, but I think it's just that there was a peak, um, and yeah. then I guess people lost interest, or maybe there were a few bad ones or whatever. But yeah, I don't think it's not. It's not like it's something that completely died, mm. changed. I guess. 
Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So this film came out in September 19th in France. Which is today. Uh, a whole three months earlier than in the US, where it came out on Christmas Day, which I think is a terrible day to release a film. Oh, same and as the, same as Eel Clowns. Well. Same as Eel Clowns, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Well, Eel, Eel, Eel Clowns was like a Christmas special. So like, yeah. you all go together, gather all the family and watch an incredibly high concept film uh, <laughs> that, you know, everyone can enjoy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think... Films don't really release on Christmas, do they? Like it's usually a little bit before. Yeah. Know? So, are, are we saying that this one was in cinemas on Christmas Day? Yeah, definitely. Are cinemas open so, on Christmas Day? They are nowadays. They might not be in. Well, they must have been if it got released. Does anyone oh, go? Yeah. Does anyone go to them? I for well, me. Well, yes. Um, if you're if you're not Christians, like if you're particularly in America, if you're Jewish or Chinese. Oh, or of course. Yeah. Because I was. Cause I was thinking, well. Be. I was for the. Well, I was sort of thinking, what do you mean if you're not Christians? Because everyone's Christian, but of course, Jew, Judaism is quite big, and they don't. Yeah, it's not a big thing. Hmm. Yeah, I'm def. I was definitely looking at it from a Christian-centric point of view. So yeah, I suppose you're. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but it is you're right. It is a weird time. Normally, you would release it in the lead up to Christmas and get the holidays all in, and then you know yeah. keep it out over New Year and stuff. So. Yeah. But apparently, this film was a massive. Well, not a massive flop, but it was a flop. Right. So that. There you go. So, lesson go. learned. Uh, hopefully, yeah. Next time, hopefully, next uh, time Warner Bros. Don't release your film at Christmas. You yeah, Joseph noobs. Leo Mankiewicz needs to really just listen to me more. Yeah, is he dead? He probably is, right? Uh, I, he looks quite dead. He's got a black and white photograph in his biography thing. Yeah, he died uh, nineteen ninety three. Yeah. So he's been dead for longer than I've been alive. So, oh. We, we've we've not done historical context, Jamie. Yeah, go ahead. I can't believe it. Before we get into the film, we always like to talk mm-hmm. about what was going on this day. Um, so, mm-hmm. a, a, apparently, according to TameMeBack.to, September the 19th is Hermione Granger's birthday. What, in 1970? I don't I know. I'm... It was in the 1971, no. but I, I assume not. Yeah, because Harry, uh, Harry Potter's set during the 90s. Yeah. Uh, um, she'd be like twenty something. So I'm not really sure. I I think it was in the holidays section. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. National holidays. So yeah, yeah, it's also International Talk Like a Pirate Day. Did you know that? Um, I know that they chose that day because it's a day that had one of the few days that had no proper holiday on it already. Oh really? Seem to be filled. But it has Hermione Granger's birthday on it. Well, I mean, you know, J.K. Rowling hasn't done anything original in her entire life just had to steal uh, talk like a high pirate day's funder that's true um oh talk like a pirate day was created in 1995 so also was not being celebrated in 1970 yeah. um i remember that um i think minecraft used to celebrate international talk like a pirate day um and you for for today only you could change your language to pirate is that right I've, I was never into Minecraft. Or is it another game? There was a game, definitely, where you could change your language to pirate and it was all... Oh, it was The Sims. It was The oh, Sims. Um, Likely. I don't. I can't remember if it was just on International Talk Like a Pirate Day or if it's just always in the settings. But yeah, you can change the language to um, pirate and instead of saying, like, go to bed, it's like, sleep in your cabin or, or whatever. I don't know. That was a yeah. bad example. But they do, uh, yeah. Anyway... That's uh yeah so that's that's totally pirate day. Uh, the first ever Glastonbury happened on September the nineteenth, oh, nineteen seventy. That sounds quite significant. That does sound quite significant. It was sort of buried yeah. away, but yeah. Um, I suppose Woodstock was only like two years before, so maybe that overshadows the birth. Of Glastonbury. Yeah, I mean, I suppose Glastonbury Woodstock is very of its time, whereas Glastonbury is still going. So the fact that it was mm. made that specific day is probably not that relevant, but. Yeah, I believe. Uh, yeah, inaugurated nineteen December nineteen seventy. So it, oh, it's, it turns fifty this today, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah it does obviously, because that's what the podcast Congrats is. To it. That's the whole point of yeah. the thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there we go. Um, happy, happy. Uh, what's it? Bicentenary. Yeah. Glastonbury. Uh, oh, obviously, but, but it's not on this 50th year. Fiftieth anniversary Glastonbury show. I'm sure will be. It was cancelled. Um, but apparently they, they actually take a year off every five years anyway to give the oh, land, so that, so. the land, local population and organizers a break. Um, mm. But they took a break in 2018 and they're declaring this one the same thing. So 
It's not right, really... so like reset it, as it were. Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. First ever Glastonbury. That's kind of significant. Uh, Tom Jones mm-hmm. was on the cover of Life magazine, which is just uh, wow. cool. He's still going, you know. Yeah. Uh, which is cool to think. And there was an article about five easy PCs, which, as usual, I didn't bother reading, but um, good, just good, good. keeps us relevant. Trog, Trog was also on Take Me Back. Oh yeah. As a film that was out and being watched at the time. Um, not sure I'm why. Imagine too many people were watching it. No, <laughs> I'm not sure why it was now, but yeah, it was. And also, Tora, 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 which we're watching next week, was was there. Yep. Um, mm. Which I, I'm looking forward to, as you know. I am it could very be much awful. not looking forward to. It could be awful. Yeah. Um, but it we'll sounds see. precisely like the sort of thing I hate. Uh, yeah. See? So, let's let's move on to what was this film called? There, Crooked Man. There was a Crooked Man. There was a Crooked Man. Right. Do you want so, to do the plot? Do it. Hit yeah. It. So, as you know, this is still the point in uh, film history where uh, the credits usually come up before the start of a film. Again, yep. uh, I'm very much in favour of. I would say that There Was a Crooked Man has the best opening credits we've seen so far. Uh, it has very nice page backgrounds. It has a yeah. fucking back in theme tune. The theme, um, the theme song reminded me a lot of uh, A Man Called Sledge. It does. Only... Definitely- I was very glad that they didn't repeat it a hundred times. Um, yeah, well, they repeat it like lyriclessly, uh, like they do the tune, and then towards the end, there's a cool subversion of it uh, as like the end credits roll. But like, it yeah. has its time to shine at the beginning. Exactly. Uh, whereas, whereas a man actually, called Sledge, it was just constant. Uh, yeah, coming on this off. is a much better film than a man called Sledge in most regards. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Although, having watched Man Called Sledge, this one is also very similar in uh, that it's a it western actually, where a guy yeah. goes to prison and there's a lot of money that he needs to break out of the prison to get. I mean, it's not mm. quite the same, but um, yeah, when I read the synopsis, well, basically, when I read the synopsis, or the not even the synopsis, just the thing that comes beneath when you when you buy the film, um, I thought, mm. this sounds a lot like Man Called Sledge, but I'm sure it isn't. Uh, and then when I started playing the opening credits and it had a theme song that was basically explaining what, what the film was about, I then was really worried yeah. that it was going to be the same. But as you have just um, said, and as I'm sure... Although credit to uh, There Was a Crooked Man's theme song, it is at least not as blatant. It has a little bit of... Yeah. Su- more alludes. Mm, uh, mm. Definitely. But yeah, it's... I, I was think, thinking about it. I think the thing is that if you're filming a Western, um, it's really convenient to have any film like set in one location because then you can build a really like nice, expensive set as yeah. this film did. And like you just focus around that. This so set, this set cost that, 300 grand. Yeah, yeah. which uh, would have been ridiculous in those days, of course. Um, True. Because that's before the bad shit happened, really, in terms of inflation. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, if you're going to have, if you want one setting in a Western, then like you're either going to have it in a frontier town or a prison or like the two obvious places. Yeah, or both, like, as, as this film has. Well, yeah, but you know, like if you're gonna go all hog, whereas if you're you can't going wandering around the open plains, obviously gets expensive after a while in terms of shooting on location. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so there was a crooked man. We opened with a robbery at dinner time. Yeah, um, there's like a well-to-do family. Uh, a racial stereotype is there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> serving them dinner. Yeah, that was. Uh... Uh, I mean, to be expected, but I was, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, reminded me very strongly of Tom and Jerry, if anyone's curious as to which one. Yeah. Um, a nice, uh, African American maid, uh, who is very stereotypical. I think yeah, that will, uh, serving them dinner and then the family gets robbed at gunpoint, um, at like the dinner table. Uh, and then we meet our main character who is called Paris Hilton. Paris Pittman. Paris Junior. Hilton. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, pa- <laughs> anyway, so Harris Harris Pickman. Yes. Ha- Harris Pickman. Paris um, Paris Tick Ben. Harris uh, Click Ben. Paris Pittman. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Paris Pittman, even. Um, yeah. So he he's our main character. He's uh, played by uh, dear Hen not Hen Kirk Fonda, Douglas. Kirk Douglas. <laughs> The other one. Kirk Douglas, who was in Spartacus and Pass of Glory. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's like a very charismatic robber. Um, yeah. Like he gets his gang to look out the ship, but he has a whole thing about like, uh, he talks about the fried chicken and he has a little speech where he's like, oh, isn't fried chicken best? Like, sort of straight out of the oven. I'm sure you guys would prefer to eat it right away. And so you should give me my money very quickly, right? Uh, 
So, you know, he's uh, cool and intimidating, uh, just a little bit likable, a little bit dangerous. Yeah. Uh, ain't that fun. Um, so he robs this man uh, who has a million dollars all stacked in one safe. Um, and he, you know, flees into the night. There's a bit of a gunfight. Um, the white people try and fight them off. The, the help uh, refuse to. Yeah, because uh, they get paid enough for this. Yeah, the, uh, the man goes to help, and the woman says something like, uh, "You, you ain't never gonna risk your life for no white man, or something like that." Um, yep. Right. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Something um, along those lines. Something very much along those lines. Yep. And uh, in the gunfight, um, the <laughs> homeowner gets shot in in injured, and the it's a couple of. Uh, Paris's gang gets shot, but then Paris shoots the rest of his gang as well, so that he gets all the yeah. money. Mm -hmm. Which is a good tactic. Um, if you're ever robbing uh, somewhere, shoot the rest of your gang before they shoot you, and then you get all the money. That's true. I'm looking forward to our heist next week, mate. Yeah, me too. Uh, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, Paris, uh, Paris Pittman uh, yeah. walks off to the middle of the desert, and Sort of buries half the money in the middle of a rattlesnake nest. Yeah, best place uh, to bury. Obviously, uh, the best place to bury. Why would there any be any difficulties? Uh, yeah. I feel what you want in a place where you're hiding money is for it to be out in the open, to produce a lot of noise, uh, and to injure you if you ever want to go back to get it. Yeah. Uh, can't think of any real advantage whatsoever beyond digging a hole and just sticking it in there. I guess it's easier to find. Yeah, definitely easier to find. Um, you know the the noise of the rattlesnakes. Yeah, the noise of the rattlesnakes will attract to it, and obviously, you know the noise of the rattlesnakes. You're not going to get bitten by them because you're going to hear them. You know, exactly. You know, you you know that there. And what rattlesnakes rely on more than anything is the element of surprise, and that's just not gonna happen to you. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we cut to the millionaire or former millionaire. Yeah, Next millionaire. He walks up to a brothel. Uh, run by a slightly less offensive racial stereotype, although still very so firmly in the model. Although pretty progressive to have a business owner be uh, an African American woman. Yep. Um, but a uh, bit of a shame that she's such a stereotype. But um, you know, baby steps, baby steps. Baby steps. <laughs> um, so he walks up to her and he's like, oh, "I'm so sad. I got robbed." And yeah. She's like, well, you know what? If you want, you can have a wee perv on the clients just on the house, mate. Okay, because because we're buddies. Yeah. Uh, so he goes off to do that. There's a judge there who's also having a fun time on the other peephole, uh, and then he looks through and then he sees Paris Pittman. Uh, he's blowing his money. He sees the, what? He sees time. the guy that stole his money. Yeah. Incredible. Unbelievable. Um, so this promptly leads to Paris getting arrested and tried by the judge for ten years. Yeah. Uh, we then move on to this is the the pro the first half of this film um, is showing how various members of what will become uh, the heist gang, as it were, for this film get arrested. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe our second one is like these two con men. Uh, one's pretending to be like a priest, and one's pretending to be uh, deaf and mute. And you know he's. Sort of talking yeah. about how, like how their charity has like given them an artistic outlet, so you can now be a great artist. And you know, wouldn't it be great if you donated money to them? Yeah. Um, but of course, there's a fun wee mishap uh, where the mute man accidentally leans against the stove, and then he jumps up and says, "Ow, my high knee's been burned," <laughs> thus giving the game away. Yeah, that does uh, somewhat ruin the uh, whole thing about him being deaf and mute. It does ruin the illusion. Yeah. Um, then there's one man who robbed, uh, so robbed a merchant and went to a bar to get a saloon. And then the sheriff, played by Henry Fonda, who will become a very important character, uh, walks into him and he's like, "Hey, mate, just put the gun down. You can go quietly." Uh, and then the robber just shoots him in the leg. Yeah. But he gets overpowered uh, in the end, so he's also arrested. Yeah. Um, one more. Oh, and then we got. Um, K. Cameron, I think is his name. Coy. <laughs> Coy Cameron. Coy Cavendish. Coy Cavendish. Yeah. It's a stupid name. Yeah. Um, who is an actor who... that we've never seen before. Oh, but we have. What? He's from Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. He is from Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. He's the one that gets raped by Z-Man or whatever happened yeah. in that weird film. We've also uh, seen Henry Fonda before twice. Yes, we have. We've seen him once briefly in uh, Too Late the Hero. Too Late the Hero, and Fucking. then more. 
Yeah, and then more resolutely in um, Chai Chai and Social, Social Club. Club. Yeah. yeah, and for those that don't remember, he was also in uh, Once Upon a Time in the West and Twelve Angry Men and and other various. Other more. I I didn't even realize he films. was in this until I looked up the cast. For some reason, I didn't recognize yeah. him. Well, he ha- he has a beard, and that always throws people off, right? It does really yeah threw me off. But yeah, there's a lot of quite big names in this. Warren Oates is in it. Lee Grant's yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, uh, Yang Chuan the Kang tea. is in it. <laughs> he was a Taiwanese um, decathlon athlete. Yeah. He plays another lovely anyway. racial stereotype in this film. Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Koi uh, is having uh, you know relations with a young girl, and then yeah. her father comes in with a shotgun. He says, "Why are you messing around with my daughter?" And she says, "Shoot him, daddy." <laughs> Self-defense, uh, he sort of chucks a billiard ball at him and he goes down. Yeah. Um, we know that Koi has uh, been sentenced to hang. Uh, it's not clear if he's like been tried with rape or murder, but it's clearly one of the two. Yeah. Uh, Probably murder, so, I would think. But... Maybe. Maybe. Uh, right. I think either is plausible in the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so they all sort of arrive in the cell about one at a time. Uh, the warden's here. He's a no-nonsense fella. Uh, you know, the prison's quite harsh, uh, very hot, you gotta break rocks. Yeah. But uh, in the cell, they meet uh, the Missouri kid, who's like an old timey um, train robber, apparently one of the best who's ever lived, who's been in this jail cell for about 30 years. 35 years, I think. Uh, 35 years, yes. Yeah. Uh, so he's the one who can sort of do the very important job of telling them that it's hopeless and they shouldn't, you know, even dream about escaping, because that would definitely be impossible. Yeah. Um, and then they also meet uh, a Chinese man uh, who they address using a very similar word. Uh, who's yeah. So they they say apping. they say where he's from, and then they say man, but they don't. They yes. they, they say the place that he's from. Um. Mm-hmm. Um. So I for, I wasn't entirely sure why he got arrested. I think he just hurt some people. It it um, they don't think they, I don't think they ever specify. Um. Yeah. That the guy that he's plays him. There. The guy that plays him is a decathlon athlete. Um, So I think it's one of those things where, you know, some films have athletes in them and they just, like, pick stuff up and throw it and stuff. His only role in the film is to, like, look strong and then pick stuff up. Exactly. So I think it's it's one of those things where, um, yeah, it's like the athlete. um, And I don't think he's an actor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we see the prison. Uh, they have to break rocks up as sort of pointless labor. Uh, yeah. Such was the fashion at the time. Um, so they go with the pickaxes and stuff like that, and it's clearly pretty backbreaking labor. Uh, the con artists have like a bit of funny dialogue where one of them says that it's bad for his heart. Uh, they so have this sort of like dynamic where they bicker like an old married couple. Yeah, which I really like. This is the comic relief of the film. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. I thought it was really uh, good. I might as well say right now, I thought. The dialogue in this film is a very good, but I thought it was very modern as well in a way that we haven't seen in a lot of films. It's got a cert- that certain tone where it's just a bit jokey, but not quite a full comedy, which I realize I identify very much with more yeah. modern film- films we've been seeing. It felt quite ahead of its time. I, d- I didn't really notice that, but now that you say it, yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the film, even the best films that we've watched for this have all been things where I'm like, yeah, I appreciate this is like an art form thing. I think this is the very first one where I could be like, if I was just kind of tired and just wanted to zone out to something, I could t- I could stick this on and I would enjoy myself. Uh, in the same way that I would like a Marvel film or something right now. Interesting. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so just to bring in that particular uh, point of praise. Well done. Um, so the warden, uh, it turns out, is kind of crooked, and he offers uh, Paris the chance to, you know, he'll help you, him escape if Paris gives him half of his money, and then they can split it and head down to Mexico together. Uh, and Paris agrees to this, um, and it seems that the plan is to, like, have Paris hide in solitary, and then, like, they'll, you know, covertly scoosh him out later. Yeah. Uh, but it turns, but the, the warden gets killed in a prison riot before any of that can happen. Yeah. So, bust. But Warren's replacement is the sheriff from earlier. Uh, oh. Played by Henry Fonda, yeah. And the sheriff, uh, we find out, is kind of unpopular with the town's uh, hoi polloi, the people who really run the show, uh, because he's too soft. They say on criminals, he doesn't treat them like the animals they are. Mm-hmm. Um, so he comes to the prison, and he's got this new program where he's super big into rehabilitation. He's like, um, you know, okay, we're not going to do a pointless work anymore. We're going to do useful work. I'm going to have you all build uh, a dining hall. We're going to build a hospital. Um, yeah. 
you know, if you have any truck problems, you can come talk to me about them, and I will deal with them. And we're gonna, you know, be constructive. Yeah, I don't so think. A, um, I don't. I assume that's not accurate. Um, like prison reform, presumably was not really a thing. I we think did it so in school, didn't we? Actually, yeah, um, not I in think... the US. But I'm trying to think what kind of time it was that like reform became a cool, cool and hip thing. Maybe it is. Accurate. I, I'm sure people were writing at. People were probably writing about it about now. Yeah, but I don't. So, think... Do you know what? Probably was accurate. Yeah. But like clearly, I mean, even nowadays, this is there are almost no countries beyond Scandinavia that are like showing the kind of prisons that Henry Fonda runs. Yeah, uh, this is true. So like he's very very ahead of his time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure about the film's stance towards it, but we'll get to that as time goes on. Yeah. Uh, so Henry Fonda's. So he realizes that Paris is going to escape, and he's you know he levels with him. Uh, Paris tries to bribe him, but like they both know he's never going to take it because he's a very morally upstanding man, and that's sort yeah. of their dynamic. Uh, you know, they both kind of hate each other, but they sort of get along as well, just because they know each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, they understand each other to an extent, although uh, Henry Fonda still believes that Paris can be reformed uh, into something better than himself. Uh, so throughout all this, Paris is planning on escaping. Uh, he never really gives up on that dream. Um, so what it comes down to is that uh, as the dining hall is being built, uh, one of the conmen is a good painter, so he gets a painting job, uh, which gives him access to like the supply shed. Yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, the Missouri kid is has a cleaning job in the gun locker, uh, at the barracks specifically. That also gives him access to the guns. Yeah. Um, so his big plan is that there's going to be a big speech when the dining hall is unveiled, uh, and you know the big governor is going to be there. He's going to see Henry Fonda's achievement. Yeah. Uh, during that time, they're going to blow up the wall using dynamite from the supply shed. And as all the prisoners rush out of there, uh, they're all going to go out the front gate while the guards are distracted. All six of them, and they're going to go to glorious freedom. Um, so that's the plan that they're sort of working on in the interim. Uh, there's. In sort of advance of the governor's visit, um, Henry Fonda and Paris have a very nice, very interesting conversation, I felt, where um, Fonda sort of says to Paris, like, why are you doing this? You should stay here and you should reform yourself. You know, I'm trying to help you. Yeah. Uh, And Paris's retort uh, is that he's still going to be hanging coy, uh, which I thought was kind of an interesting sort of comment on reform. Yeah. Obviously, how nice a prison you make it is still a prison. A it's prison. still always going to be tra- trampling on people's like human rights, uh, regardless of whether you think it's valid to do that or not. Yeah. Um, and particularly when the death penalty is in the mix, it's always going to be um, a fool's errand to create a prison that could be really constructive. I think, as an idea in and of itself, it's not built for that. Um, I suppose that's sort of what, in many ways, Henry Fonda's character struggles with. He's very much a reform the system from the inside man for most of this film. Yeah. And he feels spectacularly. Um, well, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, he does. But only because... I feel like the, the, the other prisoners kind of like it, though. Yeah, I think... No? What, I think I think the, the, the spanner in the works is that Paris just wants yeah. to escape because he's a, he's a crooked man. I don't know if you know, but... Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. He is a crooked man, yeah. so he uh, yeah. yeah. Just to like very briefly state it, uh, Paris st- starts another riot, uh, and that's how he escapes. Um, yeah. To give context to what we're about to discuss, um, but yeah, I was sort of wondering whether the film was like down on his things and was, like agreeing with the governor that like these criminals really are just you know monsters and they shouldn't be treated with kindness. But I don't think that's it. At no, all. I don't think so. I, I think the I think really it's it's about Paris specifically and how yeah. he just I think does it's... everything for himself. Yeah, I think it's about the sort of monstrous selfishness of yeah. the act, Paris right. destroying the prison ecosystem when he knows that like it's become far better than any of the exactly. inmates could ever reasonably hope for. Exactly. Uh, just yeah. for his own gain. Yeah. Um, yeah, the same way that he shoots his own crew at the, the start. Crew. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of a lot of the climax. Uh, this film's slightly awkwardly structured, uh, and that I feel is like a climax, and then. A, weird sort of epilogue uh, which is yeah. apparently which like apparently this film used to be 40 minutes longer which i very much believe um, mm. but then it was cut down by uh, the studio interesting uh, but anyway um but so anyway. 
they have their discussion. Um, you know, Paris challenges Fonda's beliefs. Yeah. Uh, and then we get to the dining hall, and the plan goes off without a hitch. Uh, there's like the governor's there, there's a school teacher there. There's chicken. Um, Fright, they're all having fried chicken. chicken. Like, yeah, so Fonda's asked Paris to give a speech to on behalf of the inmates to talk about, like, you know, how much they like it. Yeah. Uh, and then Paris just, A, trashes the idea. Uh, he says, like, oh, we're the worst criminals in the world. And look at us here, eating delicious chicken. Yeah. Uh, very clearly, like, trying to play into the governor's moral rankles with the ideas. And then he starts a food fight and thus a riot. Um, the school teacher gets carted off in a very uh, worrying way. Um, and uh, in the confusion, a guard gets shot by the Missouri kid who accidentally walks in on him trying to steal the guns. Yeah. Um, so we get to the point where the sort of five members of the cast are here and they're about to escape. Um, so uh, Paris says to the two old con men uh, that they should wait in the carriage to cart off when they're done. And he says to Coy that he should open the front gate so they can sort of scarp her. Uh, they try and find the Missouri kid, but he's killed that guard, and he's clearly just completely out of it mentally. Uh, he can't deal with the chaos at all. He feels he's completely ruined any opportunity he's had of any sort of return to normalcy. Um, and the character beat that didn't quite land for me. I don't know if it did for you. What? 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 what the what? like Missouri. The Missouri kid's mental breakdown. Oh. Um. I think it's that thing of. He's so used to it. You know the um you know in the Shawshank Redemption when the guy just hangs himself because he I've never seen Shawshank Redemption. Oh I've just spoiled the ending. <laughs> uh I'll I'll forget about it, don't worry. Uh well it's like an old guy who's so used to being in prison, um, that when he gets released he just like can't cope with outside life. Uh, and I feel mm. like this is not quite that, but I think it's the same kind of thing. Um where if I mean if you read the film as a kind of critique of the prison system, which I guess you could. Um, I feel like it's a bit of that where he's finally got this chance to escape, but he realizes that he, he doesn't want to, and he regrets shooting the guy, and he just wants to, you know, he's so used, to, he's just accepted that he's not going to escape, I guess. Yeah, I suppose that's right? true. But he, he, says he, he says he's shot away his opportunity for his farm Yeah, uh, that he wanted this entire time. Yeah, cause is he was, was he going to get released at some point? Uh, presumably, Mm, well, he's been there for five years, so presumably not for a long time, if at all. No, but that would imply, if he says that, that would imply that he was going to get released at some point, and he just accepted yeah. that he was going to stay, and obviously the fact that he's yeah. now shot a guard means that he's going to get hung, or if he escapes, he's going to have to flee to Mexico or something, whereas maybe yeah, he had an idea true. for a life afterwards. I mean, he Could still had a, a life in prison, even if it wasn't a good one. Although, of course, it was becoming a good one. Uh, oh, he had to farm, of course. Forms. He has yeah. a farm in the prison, right? Uh, is it in the prison? I just thought he owned a farm and that was, like, waiting for him. Oh, maybe. I I remember him saying something and I thought that he had a prison in the... Uh, a, prison in the a farm in the prison where he was growing stuff. Well, he said that 25 be, acres, so that would be quite hard to fit inside a prison. Oh, well then, yeah. <laughs> In that case, you're right. Um, cool. Anyway. Yeah, Regardless, so time, he has a breakdown. Um, and uh, I think yeah, it's probably because he's so used to it. Yeah. Um, so Paris uh, reveals that um, he has no intention of going out the front gate. As he said, he's going to leave those two old men in the cart because he yeah. thinks there'll be a burden on the way back. Yeah. Uh, and he's leaving Coy to go out the front gate as a distraction because he says he's going to be hung in a week anyway, so it doesn't matter if he dies or not. Uh, yeah, which is a cool showing of his for hypocrisy, as it were. Uh, you know, he made the arg challenging argument to Henry Fonda, but he doesn't even believe in it, really. Yeah, uh, he's equally not even equally happy. He's Henry Fonda is willing to kill him to uphold the law, which is kind of fucked up in its own way, but it's not nearly as fucked up as uh, killing him just to sort of further his own selfish ends. Um. Mm -hmm. So they abandoned those three. Uh, the sheriff, former sheriff, now warden, uh, sort of chases them on the rock pile, and he's about to shoot them. Uh, but then the Chinese man, um, Aping, uh, leaps down from one high and knocks him out on a rock. Uh, but in the process, has killed himself. Uh, and yeah. Paris considers shooting him, but decides not to. Uh, yeah. Presumably out of a sort of residual fondness for him. Yeah. Um, and then he and uh, his 
he and the last guy left, who is Floyd Moon, uh, wander out into the plane, and Floyd says, we're free, we're free, just the two of us, like any sm good, smart person at the end of a heist, when every other member of your crew has been abandoned. <laughs> he's completely confident that it'll just be the two of them now, spl splitting the money equally, well, now that he's served well, his role. Jimmy, obviously, I mean, that's what's going to happen for our heist. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. At the end of the heist, I want you to turn around and face the other way, um, just for, well, just I imagine for a second. I'll, I mean, I want to admire the view of like the place we exactly. Just so <laughs> when we rob it, we're going to leave the place with all the money, and then mm -hmm. I think it would be nice if we took like a photo to commemorate it. So if you give me all the money, exactly. so I have it, and I'll take a photo. And if you, and what's important is that we've killed backwards. our two comrades who we're planning on killing our two comrades who we were going to split the money four ways. Well, with, cause yeah, because split splitting it, two it, ways, and splitting there'll be more it two money. ways is so much. You want more money? Splitting it, and yeah. they're going to tell on us. Obviously, mm, so exactly. yeah. One thing. So th just quickly, my camera makes this noise. It kind of goes like, Ch -ch -ch, like that before it takes a photo. Mm, one of those old timey ones. So when you're when you're facing the bank and you've given me all the money and you hear Ch -ch -ch, that's just the camera getting ready to take a photo. And then it's kind of you might hear a, a kind of bang as it takes a photo, but it's it's because the flash is so like oh, it's, it's, it's one it's of those really, really old cameras. It's really old. So like you have Victorian. to load the film, Ch -ch, load the film, and then. Poof, that's flashing off. So when you hear that, I mean, you might not hear that. Oh, you would hear it, obviously, because you're going to hear me take the photo. But just don't worry. And, and then fine. we're going to leave together, fine. And With all the money, rest, and we'll split the, the money completely. halfway. Yes. Um, and mm. yeah, that'll be fine. So just so you know, exactly. Yeah, looking um, forward to it, bud. Same, same thing that happens in this film because, of course, Is it? Paris and of course Paris goes. Well, I killed those other five guys, but you know yeah. what, Lloyd, I like you. Exactly. Um, so Lloyd. Genuine Lloyd earlier was offered a chance by uh, the sheriff to sell out Paris and tell him what his plan was, but Lloyd didn't because he felt loyal to him. Uh, he yeah. said that Paris was a true friend. Yeah. He sold out other gangs before, but just because he didn't like them, uh, he, yeah. was, he com genuinely completely loyal to him. Yeah. Uh, and then Paris turns around here and says, "I can't trust you," and shoots him twice in the chest. Yeah. And Lloyd is clearly very genuinely betrayed uh, and deeply like. Uh, shocked and upset at yeah. what's happening, not just because he's dying, but also because it turns out that Paris was never his friend at all. Yeah, um, he was never a friend to any of them. Actually, uh, he's been lying the whole time. Uh, there's, we go back to the guys in the cart. Uh, Paris has ridden off, and they notice that Paris's glasses that he's been wearing throughout most of the film were here. And it turns out they're just plain glass, uh, which is you know a very common twist. Yeah, uh, but one I always think is really cool. I like I it. It's a nice wee one. Nice wee twisteroo, I would say. You know what? There's, cl there's cliches in the world. Some of them are terrible. Some of them are. Some of them whip ass. And this yep. is one of them. It's whoop ass. Mm -hmm. It's a can of whoop ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so they, the two con men discuss riding out the open front gate. But uh, the shorter one, who pretended to be deaf, uh, says yep. that there's no point because they're going to be shot anyway. Um, yep. What's best for them is if they just wait out their time. And so in. In front of a wide open gate, they just calmly walk out of their carriage and they walk back to their cell and they close the door behind them. Yeah, they uh, have a little, they have a little married couple argument. Um, yeah, and then he I mean, says, "I'm going to get the taller one." Do you think they're gay, Jamie? I'm sure that wasn't intentional, but I would absolutely buy it. I think uh, they're a gay couple. Yeah, um, I think the film works better if you interpret it that way. Definitely. So why don't we? Yeah, oh, they're like an old married couple, and I think they actually are uh, an old couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I want to believe. And yeah, the deaf the deaf one has a shorter sentence for some reason. Because uh, um, he cried at the trial, apparently. Oh, okay, I missed that bit. So yeah, he's getting out a bit earlier. So he says, "I'm going to go. I'll get a job for a bit. I'll buy us a nice house, and then you'll come out, and we'll live happily ever after." Yeah. Um, as a gay couple, but not because mm -hmm. it's 1970. But you yeah. know, although it's slightly fucked up. Um, in order, the short man was always like uh, more on board with sort of. Um, Staying in the prison the whole time, but in order to sort of recruit him for the heist, the taller one uh, tries to kill himself. Yeah. Uh, in the hopes that the short man will stop him and be so uh, like distraught that he'll agree to help, so he hangs himself with a belt in front of him, uh, whilst yeah. the short man like all the time like sort of shaking his head like, oh, he'll never do it. And then he, like he genuinely does like leap off the stool and start choking, and it's only then that he's able to. The short man like takes it seriously and saves him, uh, yeah. and like he's really genuinely distraught. But then like. Over the shoulder, the tall man does a wink at Paris to show that it was all a ploy. Yeah. Which Although, a ploy where he probably could have easily died. Yeah, it's very fucked up, but it's also very sweet, very sweet that he had faith in him, that he knew that he would come to save him. 
Yeah. Uh, in its own way. Only true love can really describe such a bond. Exactly. Yeah. True platonic love. You know? Mm-hmm. It's like um, when it's like that, that thing where um you know the memes where like archaeologists find uh like men buried together and they're like, Oh, they must have been such good friends. Yeah, exactly. It's like that. This film is like that, I think. Just bros being pals. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yeah, fucked up relationship, but you know, they're very close. The yeah. short man can do better and perhaps he'll realise that one day. Maybe he'll get out and find another man to be good mm. friends with. <laughs> <laughs> to be knows? good 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 living buddies with. Yeah. And um, now now Jimmy, that sounds like that was a big climax, so that's the end of the film, yeah. right? Well, you see, the thing is, if I were, uh, at least when I was watching it, I was thinking, you know, you should end it after they close the door on themselves. That's sort of every arc, like, sort of yeah. wrapped up fairly neatly. Uh, you know, the sheriff's lost uh, his ideological belief. Yeah. And he's, the prisoners have all escaped. Uh, yeah. Paris has been rewarded for his selfishness and, you yeah. know, managed to escape. Everyone else has been duped, apart from two guys whose only victory was, you know, uh, accepting the feat. But wait a minute, Jamie. Have ten minutes left. Do you it's like Return of the King. Do you not remember that there was something with a snake pit? Surely there was. They wouldn't have done that for no reason. And there's ten minutes Just left. My cool. player here. What could happen? So we see Paris uh, on his journey. Uh, he stays the night with a random widow. Yeah. And um, I don't really know why that scene's there, but you know why. No, there's no, there's no. We we don't meet her earlier, right? I don't think so. Okay, Unless like, she was one of the. I don't know. No, yeah, I, I, didn't, just, I didn't think so. I think it's just to create a trail that like the sheriff can follow. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so I, mean, the I, sheriff... I guess you could have a connection to him just without being in the film, but it's a bit of a weird way that yeah. they do it. Whatever. Um, Whatever. So I, I I suspect that given that we know this film was cut down from something much longer, they may have had like a more emotional arc, as it were. Uh, yeah. Something. Definitely. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the nice thing about knowing that a film was cut down is that you can always just speculate that it was, it was it what was you better. wanted it to be the entire time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the sheriff says, okay, I'm going to hunt down Paris myself. You know, it's personal. Uh, I need to do this myself. We see the prison. Uh, it seems to be back up and running somewhat. It's not really possible to tell whether it's still the reformed prison or not. Yeah. Um, although one finds it unlikely. Uh, the sheriff goes. He knows roughly where the gold is buried because obviously he knows where he was, where Paris was arrested. So he's going to check in that area. Um, so he goes along the trail, and we see Paris uh, go to the snake pit, um, and using the masterful strategy of pulling on a glove and shooting the snakes first, he yeah. reaches down and pulls out a, a satchel and a bag that contain all the money because yeah. uh, five hundred million dollars is quite bulky. Yeah. Uh, so he opens the first satchel, the money's in, he smiles to himself, then he opens the big duffel bag, and it's a snake... Not, it's, a pair, it's, a pair of pan, it's a pair of pantaloons, mate. A pair of pantaloons, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and a snake springs out and bites him on the throat. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes down, and he, he says, says, ah, shit. He says, ah, shit. Mm-hmm. His and last then, word. Is he and, bleeds then comes, out. and then who comes riding up next? Why, well, if he... it isn't Sheriff Henry Fonda seeing the ironic death of yeah. his greatest rival... Um, so, you know, what's Sheriff Henry Fonda going to do now? Uh, he's always been a morally upstanding man. Is he going to continue on that path? Or will he perhaps have been changed by the events of the film? Uh, who who could possibly say? So he rides back to the prison, uh, and it, he, we see from the sign that he's still the warden there, but all he does is slap the horse that has Paris on it and make sure that it rides his body into the prison. Yeah. Uh, and then he skedaddles himself, and he goes off to Mexico with all the money, uh, and yeah. then we get a and Spanish at no version point, of the theme song. Yeah. yeah. At no point does anyone ask what the sheriff's doing. Uh, they huh. they stand and watch as he rides up. They watch as the horse rides in. They watch as he rides away. They don't say, oh, hi, sheriff, or who's this, or what's going on, or you know, there was where just are a, you going? It's just a mass breakout. It's a busy prison. <laughs> but there's, but there's people, there's guards standing still at the gate. They, they yeah, don't but, you know, there's lots of reason why. Yeah, I suppose not. Yeah. Anyway, he rides off to Mexico, and, it turned, this, and the theme song plays, leaving us to wonder, was perhaps the sheriff the crooked man all along? Uh, or not all along, but is he now the crooked man? In Spanish. Yeah. In Spanish. Because mm-hmm. he's in Mexico. And um, do you know, you for, totally forgot a scene, Jamie. I, I forgot uh, several. I was trying to skip, but... Oh, what, you forgot the bath scene. the bath time scene? Yeah, yeah. that scene's good. 
It's a very good uh, team. They all have bad. I was going to mention it. Oh, you're yeah. going to mention it now. One of one of Fonda's. Well, I was going to say, like in the context of this film, has really nice character chemistry. Uh, yeah. The cast all work very well together. Uh, the characters all have a certain playful banter between them uh, that feels very nice and natural. One of the things I remember us complaining about with a man called Sledge was that the, his gang wasn't very like memorable or identifiable, uh, which I don't think you could possibly say was true for this film. They all make a good impression. They're all quite fun. Yeah. Uh, in their own ways, the possible exceptions being Koi and the Chinese guy, but you know. Uh, what you don't like, Koi and the Chinese guy. He's fine. He's kind of. If you think of like a good comparison, might be the chief in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but less likable because he just doesn't have much to do. I mean, not ah. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll watch that if we're still doing this in four years. <laughs> no, I will ever watch it. It's on my on my list um, to watch. But uh, like the the central dynamic of like Paris, the Missouri kid, the two conmen, and um, Lloyd. Floyd, sorry, uh, is very strong. Uh, they have yeah. you know, a good dynamic together. I, I, I think that Koi and the China man, a Chinese man fit into that well. Uh, they do. I suppose they kind of work as an accessory. The thing about Koi but is that... I know that what you mean. They're, they're a bit a separate from it. He's mostly just there to like look worried when they hang people. Yeah, yeah and the Chinese guy doesn't say anything. And then, yeah. yeah. But I think I think that having someone that's getting hung is quite important to the story, and I think Koi works in it. Um, but it's just it's a it's a nice cast to spend time with, you know. Yeah. And a nice scene that really exemplifies that is the bath time scene, uh, where as part of his reforms, Sheriff Fonda uh, says all the inmates should start bathing. Uh, and a lot of these inmates have been here for years and have never had a bath. Uh, yeah. The Missouri kid hasn't had a bath for thirty five years and refuses right. to get unchanged, so they just dunk him in it wholesale. Yeah. And he pisses in the bath as a form of revenge. <laughs> Which is hilarious. <laughs> It is hilarious, um, and it's just a nice scene, you know. Uh, uh, Paris sort of like arranges the whole bathing thing, and they all clearly respect him. It's a very fun time, uh, a showing of what might could it, might have been had Paris just been a less selfish monster who was willing to destroy an entire uh, prison ecosystem and kill five of his friends in order to get some sweet moolah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So. An interesting thing about this film, which is probably worth talking about, because I think it's the most interesting thing about it, is that it's written by the same people who wrote Bonnie and Clyde, That's David right. Newman and Robert Benton. That's right. Um, I haven't seen Bonnie and Clyde. I know it by reputation. I'm hoping you've seen it. I've seen Bonnie and Clyde. Good. Do you want to talk about it for a bit and its historical significance? Uh, no. Okay. No, um, it, it it's quite a good film. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't, when I watched it, I didn't think it was like great. Um, didn't blow my mind, but it was quite good. Um, it historically, it's significant. It's kind of one of the starts of this this era that we're talking about. Yeah, um, start of New Hollywood. Exactly before uh, what you call it, Easy Rider and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, that's I I watched it a while ago, so I'm afraid I can't really remember um, much. Um, of course, it was Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway that did the Moonlight La La Land fuck up. Was it those two? Yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. For, that's the most significant <laughs> thing. I didn't, know, I, I didn't know who they were at the time. Yeah, it was uh, Warren uh, Beatty and Faye Dunaway that said uh, La La Land instead of Moonlight at the Oscars. So, well, there you go. <laughs> Well, I haven't seen Bonnie and Clyde, but I'm interested to see it now. Um, I feel like if you're able to write characters well and do good dialogue, as it were, like convincing, fun, sort of sparky dialogue, uh, then yeah. I think it's a very transferable skill. Uh, I think it's just one of those things that you either have or you don't. Um, so I'd be interested to see how they apply that to a more um, critically lauded film uh, rather than this, which I assume, given the slight uh, dearth of... Uh, writing on the film is a much lesser known part of their career. Yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I would watch Bonnie and Clyde, although I don't feel like, I, I really can't remember it that well. Um, mm. I don't, I honestly, I don't remember it being incredible. Um, it definitely wasn't bad, but I don't really remember it much at all. Mm. Um, I always used to get it confused with, uh, what's the one of the two women that escape? Uh, Thelma and Louise. Yeah, which is a much better film. Uh, mm. And it kind of has the same ish sort of ideas. Behind it's, it, it's, it's still like escaping. Uh, yeah, escaping and a kind of road life movie through crime stuff, uh, and is much better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Bonnie, I would watch Bonnie and Clyde, but I can't really remember it that much. 
Um, but yeah, it is obviously a very significant film uh, in in history. So yeah. that's good. Um, do you want to know how this particular film was critically received? I would love to know. Not massively well. Um, there's a lot of complaints about it uh, being quite low key and not having a lot of momentum, not really right. building to any sort of point. Um, which I thought was quite interesting because I thought this film was structured and worked quite well overall. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have said it was lacking momentum, at least not compared to any of the other things we've seen. Um, I think I've said this before. I think films from this era are quite a lot, quite are often quite slow paced compared to what we're used to. Um, so I don't know. Maybe I'm just giving it too much leeway, but I feel with that in mind, it works fine. You know. Um, I guess it c- could. It could be retooled to work a little better, I suppose, in terms of pace. Um, but you know, I didn't. You know. Th- I was super bored or anything like that. No, I wasn't. Too- no, I quite liked it. Um, definitely. Yeah. It 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 wasn't super super engaging or um a great great story. But I don't think it had many flaws that I could specifically no. point out. And it it definitely you know kept me watching and. Hmm. characters and story were all you know a lot of the good. time like all you really need for a film is like uh you know a, a decent cast to enjoy and a moderately entertaining story yeah um, obviously like moral corruption uh, i which... think they should put that in the poster mate yeah a decent cast that's... to enjoy and an all right story is that what you said Something that's like what that? i said i stand by it um i suppose the sheriff's arc of like moral corruption is quite common um and i think it's pulled off fine uh, I really, really enjoyed um, Paris's. It's not really an arc, obviously. It's quite static, but um, in terms of like just showing a sort of monstrously selfish person, uh, whilst yeah, that's he's... also quite a common thing, I think this is actually a really good execution of it. He is monstrously uh, selfish. Monstrous. That shit. is worth the price of entry to see. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I found it quite uh, chilling. Is the wrong word. I didn't quite get to that level, but certainly a bit, a bit disturbing uh, towards the end. Uh, when he's he, acting, when he when he fully goes mask off, as it were, yeah, uh, and mask reveals off. that he's they just want that he's happy to just kill Koi. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the sort of turning point. But then mm. it's kind of shouldn't be surprising because you see him right not that from sp- the very start. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's definitely a wee thingy. What 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 would you rate this film? Uh, I'd say stream I would say actively seek it out don't pay an overwhelming amount for it watch it uh, which I would summarize as a watch it yes yeah I'm saying watch it as well it. same yeah yeah it's a good yeah. film um, if I had been taken out to see this on Christmas day uh, with my uh, Jewish non- family Christ- with my non-Christian family in a mostly empty theatre I'd have been pretty satisfied good I'm glad what did you think about the music I d- wasn't a big fan I loved it I thought it was really? fantastic genuinely um, um I find it quite I've annoying. Complained, I've complained, but I, it's quite intrusive, to be fair. But I've always <laughs> that. Um, I like it when when soundtracks insist upon themselves. Okay. Um, I thought fair like enough. it's definitely from like the genetic tree of like films that have like one big theme song and like the OSTs variations on that. But it has some yeah. proper proper bangers in it. Okay. Interesting. I, was never, I find it very annoying, yeah. but ah, um, that's fair. I'm glad someone liked it. I don't think any praise seems to have been given to the soundtrack, so you know what? Yeah. Done by Charles Strauss, who is, seems to still be alive. Was he? Is yeah. he related to the classical composer of Strauss? Uh, Richard, no, it's Richard spelled Strauss? differently. Did, he wrote Bye Bye Birdie, uh, surprisingly. What's that? The, it's a very famous musical. Oh, okay. Um, Good for him. It's yeah. a film from 1963, musical comedy. Huh. Yeah. Cool. Well, good for him. Mm. Okay. Um. Anything else about the film you want to say? Um. I suppose. I don't believe so. Um, in terms of thematically, how it links to other films we've seen. Oh wait, well, yeah, we should do that. Um, um. Well, we've seen a lot of westerns, and I would say they've they've they kind of blend into each other. Not in a bad way, three. but in a. They they tend to be have a lot of elements that are similar. That's true. Well, I suppose just because sl- uh, a man called Sledge was so generic, um, yeah, it becomes hard to think. Um, the Shining Social Club was not, but it did have the same actor and it had a brothel and this all this. 
Yeah, so, I'm trying to think. I don't think we've seen too many depictions of like proper evil, or at least none that are super concerned with it so far. The Conformist. He, the Conformist uh, is like Troll. a sympathetic female. Yeah. Like, he's evil, but I, I wouldn't consider him. Um, he has. He's not selfish. First, well, he's selfish. Um, not Trog. Not irredeemable. Trog is like the only one. Although I'm not giving that hatchet. Seriously. <laughs> hatchet for the uh, honeymoon. Oh, Hatchet for the Honeymoon is probably the other one, you're right. Yeah. Um, and it also, I guess, Catch-22, although that has a very specific vision of evil. Um, well, um, yeah. So, True. So, yeah, I suppose it's... But it's a very interesting... Uh, it's a very, Kirk Douglas plays a very good, charismatic villain. Obviously, he's not known for villain performances, but he does it well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, although, I suppose it's it's banking on like his natural likability, isn't it? Um, that's sort of the essence of the character. Yeah. And it, would, it wouldn't work otherwise. No. Um, no, no, no. But yeah, I wouldn't say this This doesn't seem to conform to any particular trend that I've noticed in the films we've done so far uh, yeah. beyond, I suppose, the broader historical trend going on and gaining momentum at this point of a fascination with more um, morally, not complex, but even just morally bad bankrupt characters. I suppose five easy pieces would actually be the biggest comparison from that perspective. Yeah. True. Although, again, le- not, it's not a particularly sympathetic portrait, whereas Five Easy Pieces definitely is. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, not expecting uh, the most complicated shit in the world from uh, Western. It's just no. a fun time for the family. On the other hand, Tora 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 is going to be uh, very uh, deep. Uh, I don't like military films. <laughs> well, I don't like Western films, but. That's true. Uh, <laughs> but here we are. Bug. Here we fucking are. Um, uh, what, what else have you been up to? Uh, not much. Uh, it's been working. I've done some research for my dissertation. Um, That's good. I've watched all of Clone High uh, on YouTube, which is a fantastic show. Uh, right. Very, very uh, close to my sense of humor. Uh, you know, like the ideal um, so I've been laughing away at that. It got cancelled after one series, which is very sad. But they're rebooting it, uh, hence its current uptick in popularity. Um, so it'll I be see. interesting to see what comes of that. Um, cool. Other than that, I've been meeting people in a mostly responsible way. Um, you meeting people? Yeah, just a few at a time. Did you actually? Why wouldn't I? Because because you're not allowed to. Not in their houses. Oh, you mean people outside their houses? Yeah, outside. Um, I don't yeah. know, Jimmy. I'm pretty suspicious. Uh, I don't think I've done anything else too notable that needs to be discussed. I played uh, through a game called What Remains of Edith Finch uh, the other day, which was very good. Uh, it was only two hours long, so if anyone wants uh, a nice short thing to take care of, um, uh-huh. a nice story-based thing, sort of. About, it was about sort of going through uh, an old house where every member of the family's died at one point. And oh. seeing the stories behind each of their deaths. Uh, it's not like one event, it's that they're like uh, cursed apparently to yeah. all like meet unfortunate fates. So like they've all died throughout history. Uh, but like they leave their bedrooms uh, as they were as a memorial to them. Oh. Um, and they just build the house bigger every generation. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. That is interesting. Um... Uh, anything you've been up to other than your illegal activities? Uh no, not really. I've, I this is the first time I've seen anyone uh today, and it ended up being loads the, of people. Yeah. Which are really, are you finding it hard? I'm finding it really hard. Yes. When people are ignoring it, and then you, well, you want to follow it's, it. It's quite hard when like you know if like you assert yourself, and that's like you sort of like ruining the evening. If you know what I mean. Yeah, because someone uh, said because I was so I was meeting two people today, which is already illegal. But one of them's living alone at the moment, so you know it's kind of not that bad. Um, mm. And then we met these other people. We just bumped into them in the park and kind of sat with them. And then one of them said like, "Oh, should we, should we make the circle smaller, or or, or are you guys social distancing?" And it was kind of awkward to be like, "Oh, like we 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 are, you know, trying to sit apart." But it's kind of awkward when they're just all sitting together and they don't really care. Uh, like I met with um, a friend like uh, the other day, and I was like, you know, talking with him, and like we, we were fine. But then he mentioned offhandedly that he'd had a massive gaff like a week before. And, like I really don't want 
you didn't have to tell me that. Now I'm just going to be worried about this the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, exactly. Because I well, the thing is, I know that these people, I know that the people, the people that I was planning to meet up with are fine, but the people that we ended up bumping into, I know. I mean, they're not having big parties, but I know that they're they're just ignoring it and having like mm -hmm. small parties with multiple households and this kind of thing. So I'm not too worried because I know that they're still being sensible-ish, but I just, w I wish everyone was following it very closely and then I would not feel like yeah. such an asshole for having to, or I wouldn't feel like I was missing out on everything, which I kind of do feel now, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I've, I've never been, not that I've never been too bad, but like, I feel FOMO is like an emotion I can deal with, you know? Um, yeah, I really don't like it. Whereas uh, I don't like feeling like the bad guy in a setting, you know. Uh, particularly well, exactly, if it's like if you say it, then you immediately it, like um, brings the mood down, you know. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's not cool. So that's um, yeah. Uh, what basically. else have I been up to? I've been watching film. I I tried to watch all the films I wanted to watch on movie before I paid, and then I forgot to cancel it, so I ended up yeah. paying. For a month of movie, right. um, so I need to watch. I can more continue to drastically. I watched a couple good ones. Not watch any of it. Oh yeah, have you, you've not watched anything on it though, have you? No, I should. Um, Jimmy. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a film called The Light. You cut off for a second there. And the image didn't load. And I was like, oh, what a bargain! And then it turned out to be from 2006. Um, I had I had the exact same thing yesterday. I'm just looking at it now. But yeah, the other day I looked and it's like, oh, Lighthouse, yeah. awesome. Um, I, mean, like, I don't mean to be rude. There's nothing from it that's like immediately like, oh, I definitely need to watch this. Um, no, it really, watch. it really helped that I knew it was running out because I watched everything that I wanted to watch. And I've got a few yeah. more things, though, so I'll just watch it this month and then cancel it. Uh, what yeah. did I watch that was good? I watched a Portuguese film mm. called Techno Boss, which oh, was yeah? kind of cool. Uh, it was like a musical. Um, okay, that's fun. But like a really eccentric, quirky, weird musical. I liked that mm. one. I watched the brand new Testament, which is Belgian. It was oh, really good. Yeah. It was a really good film. Uh, and I watched Showgirls, which was basically just porn. Um, <laughs> but you know, sometimes sometimes you gotta watch a film that's like that. So uh, that's fair. Yeah, that one was a bit not so much. But yeah, mm. yeah. Um, that's, uh, I I drunkenly bought uh, a month of Disney Plus um, the other night. Oh, can I steal? Can uh, I steal it? Yeah, if you want, I'll give I mean, my not pass. obviously, obviously for anyone listening, I'm not going to use Jimmy's Disney Plus because every individual should pay for their own Disney Plus. But yes, uh, low key, um, I might steal it. Yeah, I, I bought it to watch Phineas and Ferb because that's. Oh, what that's I what I want to watch as well. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Although I'll, um, I'll pro I, I might wait because I'll probably buy it again when the next Mandalorian season comes out. You sure? I'm happy to give you the. No, I, I'll take your login, but I might just I might not end up using it. All right, that's fair. If you want to just say your login now, then that's. Uh, I I I use an auto-generated password, so it cannot be pronounceable by man. <laughs> uh, also, it, we are currently recording. It was more of what yeah, I was saying. Well, you know, anyone, any, any, anyone who listens to this, a little reward. Can any of our lesbian it. listeners. <laughs> hi. Of my private email <laughs> and also uh, my access to my account. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I don't think I've been doing much else really. Uh, watching those films. I've been looking at masters and stuff to do after uni and stuff, but I uh -huh. no, I've got no uh, idea yet. So, yeah. What fool? That's what I've been doing. Considering your options after uni, why, why didn't you just go for a program that gave you one straight up? What? Th that gave you what? An option straight up. What well, even options? An expected career path. I've told you this oh. so many times. Like, I do a diploma after I've done my. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Undergraduate degree. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, man. I know. So, I know, I know. Uh, there was a crooked man. A decent time. Uh, perfectly watchable. Yeah. You go give it a go if you're bored. Give it a go. But bored. you know. And follow uh, advice, and and don't make your yes. friends feel weird for following advice. Very true. Because okay, I'm just gonna say one more thing in it. I read all these things online about how um, young people are not following it, and I think I think to myself, God, that's so unfair, and I see everyone posting, this is so unfair, but then I yeah. come up here to uni, and suddenly 
I see all these all this stuff going on, people meeting up, and I think actually, do you know what? Maybe maybe <laughs> for once, the boomers are right to blame us because from what I've seen from most people, the people it, it, it's true. Yeah, it, it was. It's it just becomes so much more difficult once there's like a social expectation that like you won't follow the advice. If you know what I mean. Exactly. But like, at the same time, it's completely impractical right now, um, which like I guess it has to be by necessity. But like obviously, um, like it's hard to like blame like a seventeen year old for wanting to socialize with people outside of their household during fresh week. Fresh oh, week it week. is absolutely yeah. Um, I mean, they yeah they. they it's such a tough one because on the one hand there's a virus that exists and is killing people and whatever but on the other hand there needs to be some like practical stuff and pragmatism and stuff you know in terms of economy and people's social lives and mental health and stuff you know that's all well it's just I feel the time I mean, the time for like decisive action has passed uh, as it were like, if there was a time to, like, properly lock down and sort it out, then that was, like, six months ago. Yeah. Um. So, like, obviously what we're living through now is, like, a clusterfuck. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I do have sympathy for, like, government departments and stuff. And, oh, like, absolutely. I I, I'm, I'm saying that it's an impossible situation for yeah. everyone. Like, but, I can't um, say, like, oh, the advice is definitely wrong. Like, they were stupid for, like, handing this out. It's just, it's the social reality. You know, the honest reality of it, and I genuinely think this is true, is that everyone's bored. Um, yeah, like, everyone's bored and everyone wants think, to see people. Maybe it's current culture, maybe it's human beings in, as like a default, but I don't think people are equipped to care about a thing for nine months. No. Um, and I just feel that a lot of people um, were just, they were able to do it for a bit, but like they've just bottomed out. They can't take it seriously anymore. Yeah. Um, can't is wrong. They aren't taking it seriously anymore, and like they should be condemned for that. But, but at the same it's time, it's entirely understandable. Yeah. I mean, I I don't blame I I I blame people that are being really stupid about it. I don't blame as long yeah. as people respect what other people want to do and you know keep it somewhat logical. You know, if you have a party with fifteen people and you know someone says you don't want to come because of social distancing, you just respect that. That's fine. But if you're having if you're if you're having a party like that and then you you know like ostracize someone for not wanting to come, or if you have a much bigger party or you know, if you I feel like if you're having any kind so. of gathering that can like be realistically referred to as a party, then that's like you being a right shithead. Exactly. Um, exactly. Like, whereas if like you're meeting like I don't know, like two other households at once, then like whilst I, it's obviously against the rules, that's hard for me to muster ire. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. yeah. Um. Like obviously, if you're being flagrantly irresponsible, then like uh, fuck you. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Um, fuck you if you're having actual proper parties or meeting up with different people every day and not distancing and stuff, fuck you. But if you're, you know, just just, just make, make yourself aware of what other people are thinking. And I think the hardest thing is if you live with someone that um, is, is, has a, sees it in a different way to you. That's a very charitable way of putting it, but I do get what you're saying. Like, um, I, this is not, I'm not talking from personal experience here because my friends mm-hmm. haven't moved back yet, but I think... You know, if you have friends that are that are that are doing it a bit differently, then you can kind of say to them, "Okay, you know, you could even say to them, I don't think you should be doing that, but whatever, I don't want to do that." But then, if you're mm-hmm. if you're literally living with someone and they see it differently, then I think that's where it's really hard because because well, yeah, like it affects you as well, obviously. It affects you <laughs> a lot, yeah. Yeah, but like it, you, it's hard to like you can't. It's not like you're not their mum, you know. You can't clamp down on their exactly. You know, all you can do is like make it. You're them aware that you're not happy with it. Yeah, that, that's all the power you have. Yeah, but then I also hate that it, the whole that thing exists at all because I mean it's the sort of thing that shouldn't even, you know, in mm. an, in a normal world, you know, it, yeah, it's just it's it's crazy. But then I you know you know a couple of generations ago they were at war and they had to black out every night and you know I think every generation mm. has this kind of major event that. Yeah. I just hope it doesn't last, you know, a ridiculous yeah. amount of time. I'm still, I'm, I'm hoping that like next year, uh, which will be my final year of uni, will be fairly normal. Um, yeah, me too. So my hopes for that are fading by the day. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, same. I, I, I can't. Yeah, I'm kind of seeing this year is mm-hmm. not a write-off, but going to be very different. But you yeah. know, I mean, to be, to, I mean, to be honest, this is, this is my final. Well, it's the last year of my undergraduate degree, last year for yours as well. So obviously it's going to be busier than 
most other years anyway, so at least it's not like... Yeah, I'm not too worried about that. been socialising that much anyway. Yeah. Um, so that's... If, you know, if it was going to happen during university, this is a good year for it. Uh, I agree, I agree. But I also think that maybe the, the social stuff is kind of important when... Yeah. You know, it's pretty depressing if you're sitting writing essays all day and then you, you're not allowed to see anyone or drink with anyone. Yeah, exactly. Well, but I guess you've got... It, it, if you live with people you like and you've got, you know, another household that you like, then you can kind of sort of... Yeah. It's it just everyone's in such different situations, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, be responsible. Uh, look after... That was a long sign-off there. It's an important one, I'm sure. Um, it's an important message for everyone to hear. Yeah. We haven't actually talked about COVID that much directly on this. Uh, I know, we, we started this right in the heat of lockdown and we barely... Talk about it. Mm. Other than saying we're getting bored with it, that uh, was just too dangerous, to too too much of a hot issue for us to look directly. Well, at. I, yeah, I feel like the, the 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 coming back to uni is is a big thing. Um, yeah, where you're where I'm I'm really starting to see because when we were at home, we were meeting mm. up, but it was really, um, just the same group. Yeah, exactly. You know, so yeah. we were distancing, but maybe not as much as we should have been, but we kind of knew what we were all doing and who we all were and stuff. Whereas I feel like the problem of uni is that, you know, if you're in a couple of societies, a sports team, and then everyone that you're in that with is with other people and they've all got boyfriends yeah. and girlfriends and you've got flatmates that are doing this and that, then suddenly you see how the whole ecosystem expands and, and that's... Yeah, like the, 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 the like social e ecosystem of uni is like a lot more uh, intertwined. Uh, exactly. Than it is back home. Yeah, whereas we were just meeting up like the same, you know, mm. same, you know, it was like five people out of a, a, a possible group of ten or whatever every yeah. time. And, and we did follow the, we did follow the rules the whole time, just to, you know, establish yeah. that. Uh, I mean, not perfectly, but as well as we could, yeah. I think, yeah. practically. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway. Well, my bum's getting sore, so do you want to sign up? Are you bent over, yeah? Uh, yeah, and my seat's really uncomfortable. I should probably buy a nicer one. Yeah, you should do. I'm going to be at the desk Yeah. the entire year. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, on that lovely, jubbly note, uh, bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, watch, watch, what was the film called? There was a Crooked Man. Yeah. 1970. And little extra assignment for all you out there, watch the 1961 and tell us if it's good, and then we might watch it. We will never watch it. Thank you, and bye. Bye. <laughs>